monocultures, probably one of the most maligned concepts in all of forestry. Whether it's in my comments section, the halls of universities, or humorously, the offices of some of the worst offending companies, there seems to be unanimous agreement in the forestry community that monocultures are bad. And with so much agreement, there must be a lot of evidence for that. Clearly, establishing monocultures is bad forestry. Look, I'm not gonna say that monocultures are good, but they definitely don't deserve the hate that they get. And I already know this is gonna be one of my more disliked videos, so let's just get into it. So first off, what is a monoculture? Who knows? It's an agricultural term, and it's meant to refer to the practice of growing a single crop in a single field, like a field of corn. In forestry, it's not so simple. You can define it so broadly or so narrowly that it's meaningless. What you have to understand is that the word is rhetorical in nature. It is meant to be a synonym with planting, and it's used precisely because it has a negative connotation. In the realm of rhetoric, planting has a positive connotation, and so big forestry companies that say they plant trees have an inherent advantage. To counter that, you have to use a word that is negatively connotated, like monoculture. You're not planting trees, you're creating monocultures. You're creating an unnatural forest. You kind of have a pro-life, pro-choice dynamic going on where you're just playing around with the language. So that's important to understand. Really what we're talking about when we're talking about monocultures is plantation forestry, planting trees. And you know, there might be some other niche management styles that fall into that subcategory, but fundamentally it's a debate about planting. So with that said, why is the hatred toward these monocultures overblown? Well, first off, natural forests tend toward monoculture. That's right, natural forests have a tendency to establish monocultures on their own. Sometimes these monocultures are temporally established, sometimes they're site-specific monopolies, and other times they're even chemically established. For example, one of the largest forest biomes in the world is the boreal forest, and the boreal forest is dominated by black spruce. There are substantial sections of the boreal forest that are near 100% black spruce, and this is a site-specific monopoly. Black spruce is exceptionally well adapted to the shallow acidic soils of the subarctic, and so nothing else can really grow there except for black spruce. So the result is a natural monoculture, or at least something approaching it. Then you have another type of spruce, red spruce, that grows on a broader range of soils in a more temperate region, so it has a lot more species to compete with. But it has one important advantage over those species. It lives longer. So it's not uncommon to find red spruce as a minority component in a young stand of balsam fir. But it outlives balsam fir by a lot. So over time, it survives and outlasts the balsam fir and becomes a monoculture of red spruce. Then there are even natural chemical processes by which these monocultures are created. Some species have a trait called allelopathy in which their dropped foliage, or I think in some cases even the roots, can release chemicals that kind of act as a natural herbicide to select for the species of that foliage. So for example, in the Northeast, we have a species, American beech, that has some allelopathic traits. American beech is often found growing with another species, sugar maple. And sugar maple is one of the most prolific germinators imaginable. They have a very high germination success rate with their seeds. It's up to 95%. And so when you go into a stand of sugar maple, it's not uncommon to see the ground absolutely carpeted with young one to two year old sugar maple seedlings. Now the vast majority of these won't survive of course, but there's still almost always a carpet of young sugar maple because of those high germination rates. When that stand has a decent component of American beech, the ability of sugar maple to germinate is decimated. Instead of seeing a carpet of green, it's a carpet of tan beech leaves. And because of this allelopathy, combined with beech's ability to reproduce vegetatively, a stand of maple and beech will tend toward beech monoculture unless special care is given. And that brings me to pando, which is the world's largest tree by mass. Now pando is unique in that it is not a single stem. It is a clonal monoculture spanning 106 acres composed of one quaking aspen organism. Now aspen, like American beech, has a really cool ability to regenerate from roots and stumps, so it can recover from a disturbance very readily, and it has an advantage over other species that might colonize the same area. It can pull from the energy reserves of the previously established organism. So while normally a tree has to take years 
uh, to build up foliage in order to, to gain enough energy to actually grow to any substantial extent, uh, the aspen can pull from previous energy reserves and just outpace the competition immediately. That is an immense competitive advantage that can create monocultures naturally. Now, of course, Pando is exceptional if only because it's a single organism. Uh, but if we were to count all the aspen stands that are different organisms but still dominated by the same species, those are much more numerous and less exceptional. In any case, what it does demonstrate is that natural forests aren't diverse by default. Now, some of you no doubt are thinking my definition of monoculture is too loose, and that most of these examples, maybe with the exception of Pando, will still have maybe a 5% rate of diversity within the stand, so they aren't true monocultures. And if that's what you're thinking, then monocultures are impossible. Think of what it takes to actually establish a plantation. Once you have a clear cut, you have an open field that is fair game for any species of grass, herbaceous vegetation, woody vegetation, and of course, any species of tree, regardless of whether or not you want them there. Now with a true monoculture like a field of corn, you're using both herbicide and density to control that competition. So you might spray the field to eliminate any herbaceous competition, and then you plant the corn densely. And as the corn grows up in a couple months, it starts to shade out that exposed soil and eliminates any possibility of competition, or at least a great deal of that possibility. So what ends up happening in forestry is you have your clear cut and it is fair game. So you have to apply herbicide in order to prevent uh, an influx of competition. Then you plant your trees, but your trees are planted very far apart and it takes years for the canopy to close. So all the while that empty space is being utilized by an ingrowth of competition. So you generally have to apply a second round of herbicide, but even then those canopies aren't closed in. So usually by year 10, you have to go in and mechanically remove any remaining competition with a brush cutter. But guess what? Even then, especially if the competition has the ability to reproduce vegetatively, meaning from the roots and stumps, you're still going to have a certain percentage of the mature plantation that is a species that is not your crop tree. That is to say, species and individuals that you did not plant. And then when you do a commercial thinning and establish trails and gaps in the canopy, you still could have a problem, despite your best efforts, with a reestablishment of an understory with species that you did not plant. There's a saying amongst experienced foresters, don't fight the forest. And that saying has come about because the forest always wins. To a very real degree, forests are not controllable despite our best efforts. And so if we have a very strict definition of what a monoculture is, you know, greater than 95% of single species, it's just not possible. Monocultures are impossible to actually establish. Or alternatively, if you really just want to slap a definition on it, it is not at all uncommon for the forestry companies that depend on planting to maybe make 5% of their planting stock a different species just so they can add their token diversity and avoid the monoculture label. But of course, anyone who spends more than one minute thinking about that will realize that it's stupid and motivated not by any sort of scientific criteria, but just arbitrary politics. They're basically tree DEI targets. Now you might say, but I've walked into plantations. They're biological dead zones. Nothing grows there. What do you mean monocultures are impossible? Nothing grows underneath any forest in a certain stage of development. If the trees are young and the canopy is exceptionally dense so that no sunlight can reach the forest floor, it's going to look like a biological dead zone. This is a clip from a natural balsam fir forest. And if you notice, it looks like a biological dead zone, but it is in fact not a dead zone. All the life is just in the crowns. As the stand develops and trees start to fall out of the canopy, you're going to have gaps develop that are going to allow a certain amount of sunlight to reach the forest floor. And that's when you're gonna have your development of mosses and other herbaceous vegetation that we love to see. This is true regardless of whether the stand was established naturally or artificially through planting. Now this is not a blanket defense of monocultures. They aren't great. But why aren't they great? The arguments against them are many and fall on a spectrum ranging from spiritual to scientific. But what I really want to focus on is one argument in particular because it's both common and scientific and evidence-based. This is the idea that planting monocultures can create ecosystemic imbalances that can lead to an epidemic of insects, pathogens, and other damaging agents, or otherwise create imbalances that lead to external costs. 
is there evidence that planting these monocultures can create these imbalances that lead to associated problems? Yes, but not necessarily and not nearly to the extent that you would think. Some studies have actually found a lower level of insect herbivory in monocultures versus mixed stands. And the reason is that ecosystems are complex. And those that say that monocultures are monolithically bad and lead to these problems are applying the same simplistic view of ecosystems that they accuse monoculturists of adopting and applying. For example, the idea that a plantation increases the food supply for a single species is not even necessarily correct. There are a lot of species that don't feed on the foliage, but rather the cambium, which is the tissue around the stem. And so a plantation held at 700 trees per acre might actually have a lower food supply than a natural stand held at 3,000 stems per acre. And of course, insects have life cycles. They might need ideal conditions for both the adult and the larva to flourish. Or maybe they need one specific condition for one specific larval instar. Maybe the leaf litter in a mixed stand is more conducive to overwinter survival rates than homogeneous pine needle litter in a monoculture. And of course, trees have immune systems. So a lot of species of insects actually need already weakened trees in order to have their populations actually take root. And the average health of a tree in a plantation is a lot healthier than the average health of a tree in a natural forest. And that's just because plantations are designed to bypass natural mortality patterns. And of course, a lot of insect species have these crazy things called wings that allow them to fly from stem to stem, making the relative frequency of a species in a specific stand a lot less important than the absolute frequency in the overall forest. I could go on and on with hypotheticals all day, but my point is this. Can monocultures create issues with insects or disease or other ecosystemic imbalances? Yes, but it's highly species and condition specific. To articulate this argument, it is absolutely vital to identify specific problems with specific species. Yes, it's a bad idea to plant ash trees because of emerald ash borer. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea to plant loblolly pine. Now, while that argument is the one I see to be the most legitimate, I don't think it's the one people care about the most. I think when people rage against monocultures, they don't like them because they don't like the aesthetics of them. They prefer the aesthetics of a natural forest. First off, this is absolutely a valid argument. There's a tendency to disregard arguments about abstract concepts like aesthetics, but it's a very real value, and beauty is something we need more of in this world. But if you're going to tell me that you don't find plantations aesthetic, I think you're lying. I don't believe you because if I go to any stock photo website and type in forest, I'm gonna be fed photos like this, which is a monoculture, or this, which is a monoculture or this, which is a monoculture with evidence of commercial thinning activity. There is a very real beauty to plantations, which is why pictures of them sell so well. It doesn't mean that natural forests aren't beautiful, it just means that they have a certain type of beauty that you don't find in natural forests, and people tend to like that. When you say that you don't like the aesthetics of plantations, what you're really saying is that you don't like the aesthetics of trees planted and thinned in rows. And yeah, fair enough, that's a horrible practice that should be stopped. Nobody wants to go into the forest and be surrounded by the aesthetics of a 90s shopping mall, but that is fundamentally a different issue than plantation forestry and should be treated as such. And people should be very vocal about this one, especially down in the South where the most egregious offenders are located. So look, that's all I really have to say on the issue. If you don't like monocultures, I get it, I understand, I do. But I hope that there is at least an angle that I've introduced here today that you haven't thought of before. I'm often accused on this channel of being a shill for various interests. Sometimes I'm a shill for the environmentalists. Other times I'm a shill for the logging industry. Uh, this is definitely one of those shill for the logging industry type videos. But what I'm primarily concerned with is that which is true. And the truth is there's a lot to criticize within the forest industry. But those criticisms need to be better. So I really do hope that even if I'm not convincing you, I'm helping you make those criticisms a little more targeted and a little more effective. All right, guys, that's all for now. If you want to learn more about managing your forest in ways that I promise aren't just about monocultures, 
you can pick up my free ebook, How to Read Your Forest, which you can get in the link in the description and comments below. And of course, don't forget, we currently have lifetime memberships available for Silvicultural, which gives you access to our online and offline mapping software, our forest growth analysis tool, our financial analysis tool, courses, and any future developments we release, which will include a land planning tool that will be re released here shortly. There have been some delays because of the holiday season, but uh, rest assured that is coming very soon. All right, that's all for now. I'll catch you later.